But without further hesitation, Christine, coming all the way from Cambridge, thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Andrew. And so, um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to come to this, uh, to this workshop. So, um, here I go. The naughty female of the subaltern class in Kashefi's version of Kalila and Demna. Um, I think it's, it would be right to say that Anvare Soheli, Kashefi's version of the Kalila and Demna stories, fascinates me. It has engaged my attention for a good many years now. Indeed, I enjoyed a generous grant from BIPS back in 2008 to spend a term of research on that topic in Tehran. And as I'm standing here in front of you, I'm just returning from a whole blissful sabbatical year during which I have finished a monograph which sets in print my findings and understanding of this text. It's going to be a fairly dense book, expressing many ideas and analyzing a sizable amount of the stories, the structure, the style, the ideas um, contained in the Timuri text. Um, my book has a specific aim, that of opening up the contents of the text to a 21st century audience. This is also a literary analysis, so it's very much ars gratia artis, no historical or other points of view will be developed. However, as is, it, as is the case with many masterpieces, when you analyze them, you have the impression that you're only scratching a surface and you should write another 10 volum volumes or encourage people to start writing 10 volumes uh, as, a, as a response to the work uh, one has done, just to do justice to the immense scope of such a text. The topic of this workshop is on subalterns, on the riffraff, on the downtrodden, on the socially unimportant elements of society, slots into an interesting side issue of my discoveries, which I relish now to set out for you. I will have to leave out all the other, perhaps equally sensational findings, um, but again, maybe the, may, may this be an encouragement for my learned audience to rush to acquire and read my forthcoming monograph, which makes for gripping reading, trust me. <laughs> and Vare Soheli, my source text, is a rewriting, as I said, of Kalila and Demna's stories. Now, this text is truly one of the seminal texts of the Orient, but it has also influenced the whole of the old world during the medieval and pre-modern periods. Although it has engaged the attention of many scholars for a lot of time, not much has been written about the global contents of the work. Attention has mostly been lavished on the legendary beginnings of the text, on the heredity of the different translations, and virtually no research has been done on the medieval Persian versions. There are five of them, five surviving texts, and my study of Kashefi is, I think, the first attempt to bring any of these to the attention of the academic community. The story of Kalila and Dimna is the story of rewriting, of misreading, of reinterpretation. It's one of the foremost examples of literary palimpsest we know about, and it shows to perfection how the authors have addressed the issues of rewriting and plagiarism over a long period of time across wide geographical areas and cultural differences. To simplify, in order to move quickly into today's topic, let's just accept that the stories that make up this text, these narratives, are metaphors, allegories, which need to be decoded in order to extract the lessons. And I might immediately tell you as well that the morals, the moral lessons, which are expressed at the beginning or the end of the stories are disingenuous, impertinent, and designed to lead the, to lead the reader astray. Every author, every rewriter, in turn, will warn in his preface that the stories need intelligent readers, able to see beyond the surface, and that there are, these stories are designed to respond to everyone's needs, according to one's intellect. Now, this is clearly a gauntlet thrown in our faces and a challenge to be amongst the group of intellectually gifted ones who crack the meaning is naturally irresistible. But this is also a carte blanche for us to play with the stories, examine their facets and make of them what we can. So, we need to decode. The Anvare Soheli, The Lights of Canopus, was composed by a remarkable, a remarkable man, Vaesko Shefi, the preacher-discloser. 
He composed it in an ornate Persian prosimetric form at the Timurid court of Sultan Hossein Baikara. We do not have a firm dating for the text, but my colleague Maria Subtelny, who is wonderfully familiar with historical and biographical data at the Timurid court, and wonderfully generous with her knowledge, has found references to a date of 1497-98. Thus, presumably, the work was written at the end of Koshifi's life. By then, he was a famous man, a renowned writer. At the court, he was also a very busy man. Uh, he held the functions of Qadi for many years. He was a famous preacher. He had a very attractive voice, says Khandamir. He was favored by Ali Shir Navoi, the very influential Messines figure at Herat. He was related to the mystic poet Jami, and he became head of a Sufi order himself. He wrote dozens of works, which are often perhaps misconsidered as mere works of vulgarization. He earned his fame with his Rosat al Shohada, which became the text of Shia uh, martyrology, although Kashifi himself might not have been a Shia at all. The text, Anwar Sohili, was also celebrated for several centuries as the most achieved example of elegant prose. Until it sadly fell victim to its success, it was used as a textbook for the British officers who were being posted in India. They would be advised to study the Anwar Sohili during the lazy days of their boat voyage to the subcontinent. The book thus was demoted to a textbook, interesting for the richness of its vocabulary and expressions, while its contents were disregarded. There is something jarring in the style of the book. It's very rich, it's very baroque in, in places, and so charged with metaphors. Reading it and tasting it to the full must be done slowly. And unfortunately, as its appreciation was dependent on its practical use and on fashionable subjective likings, it was influenced by the pendulum of taste and fashion. The style, in fact, proposed the exact opposite of what was deemed beautiful by the late 19th century uh, Persian Bozgasht literary movement, which was advocating a return to robust, unadorned, simple, majestic prose or verse. And Edward Brown, we talked about him this morning, the great Cambridge Persianist, was influenced by his Bozgasht friends, and as a result, he totally assassinated the text in his very influential literary history of Persia, and nobody talked about the Anwari Soheli ever after. So, plucking it out of the dustbin, I found that the text could be studied according to several angles, all of them equally fascinating. And one of the first findings in my attempt to approach the text was the discovery that the term animal fables, as the Khalil and Demna is often referred to, is not at all correct. There is, of course, the technical discussion about what is and what is not a fable and I'll spare you that. But quite simply, here, uh, there is a good many stories which are not featuring animals, but rather human characters. In the Anwar Sohili, if we look at the 14 main stories, we are, which are directly taken over from um, Ibn al-Mukhafas Khalil and Dimna Arabic in, uh, ancestor, there are six featuring exclusively animals, four have animals interacting with humans or, or vice versa, and four have exclusively human characters. And the same, the same ratio is true as well in the uh, sub-stories. So I then attempted to discover whether there was a difference in the synopsis between so stories with characters, animal characters and human characters, uh, whether there were differences in the meaning, the interest of the stories. And there is. Globally speaking, the stories with animals are serious, weighty, grim, harsh, cruel. The animal characters are mostly ruthless. They're locked against each other in merciless confrontations and many lives are lost. Although really, it's just as grim in the stories enacted by human characters, it's perhaps fair to say that the stories, these stories usually stop short of outright murder. And that's these are disguised in such funny situations that they have a lesser impact on the reader. So we won't look at animal stories. We'll concentrate today on the human stories. And the Kalila and Dimna human society is sharply divided between the court people and the humble plebeians, the hoi polloi. 
these two groups rarely interact in the stories. Although the text is meant to be a mirror for princes, it's clearly not targeting the attitude of the monarch towards his people. No attention is devoted to the ruler's kindness, generosity, morality, political ethics, etc. within the stories. The stories happening in the exalted stations of society will not engage us here. They're fascinating, but what I want to look at today are the specific stories which feature the naughty wives of humble station, a very unhappy group of luckless human creatures, one might say, crushed by the double misfortune, low social status and female sex. To really dip them in a bath of total misery, these creatures are usually wedded to elderly, poor, stupid, jealous husbands. We then must fully admire that under the circumstances, they do not count themselves always beaten, but proactively search for a little comfort with young and handsome lovers. Indeed, several of the stories feature typical vaudeville triangles between an old husband, his young wife, and a handsome lover. But in all fairness, we should also note that a portion of female characters with a whether animal or human, really, are paradigms of devoted and wise wives, but I'm, I'm not treating them today. Um, so the naughty female stories range from the simply amusingly inconsequential to the outright nonsensical or grotesque and unbelievable. A lot has been said, however, too hastily about an feminist or anti-feminist characterization within these stories. Several do indeed depict unhappy marital relations, but the text's aim is certainly not to provide an illustration or a social examination of the wedding bond. The way the story's characters act are the superficial metaphors, the tools around which the authors develop the episode's conundrums. There is no need to decode the stories uh, there is, sorry, there is a, a, a great need, on, on the contrary, to decode the stories, and the arresting humor and nonsense of the situation of the synopsis fairly forces us to sit down to crack their meanings. What is the point of these unfaithful wives who might be frustrated in their attempts <laughs> at adultery, which feature within these openly farcical stories? These are provocative episodes picturing shocking freedom of action and especially freedom of attitude in women who act in total opposition to social and religious tenets. I just mentioned that rather than featuring one-way critiques of naughty wives, the stories also illustrate selfish, gullible, often stupid and old, in a word, very unattractive husbands. These stories um, the characters are uh, removed miles away uh, from the male virtues of fortitude, prudence, justice and temperance, which moral literary texts pair with female virtues. So this intriguing and provo provocatively negative characterization certainly witnesses to an awareness by the authors and by their audience of the psychological and social time bomb constituted by inharmonious marriages between old men and young girls. But the Kalila and Demna story's vocation is not to act as illustrations of contemporary social realities. Focusing on these superficial and exaggerated male-female characterization does not produce really useful pedagogy. A ruler can learn nothing from this. And if this, this were all the book proposed, it would not have ever been such a fantastic bestseller through history. I propose to read the subversion of the ideal marital stereotypes in this spe specific uh, genre of stories as a medium. These stereotypes are of unlikely marital bondages are pillarite and put to use as emblematic premises for psychological demonstrations. And I would like to direct the attention to three examples of such farcical and happy bondage episodes with elements that relate to superficial misogynous critique, but which gain all their psychological worth in the light of game theory models. And as is so often the case, Kashefi, in his additions to, the, uh, to his source text, to, to, to the Kalila and Dimna text, Kashefi shows the way towards cracking the meaning of these narratives. I'll start with a famous traditional Kalilandimna story, that of the carpenter, his wife, and the lover. 
So a carpenter deeply loves his beautiful wife, but he hears increasing whispers that she isn't faithful to him. In order to know what's really happening, he decides to play a trick. He pretends to go away on business for a couple of days, but in fact, he steals back in the darkness and hides under the bed. And sure enough, as soon as he's gone, the wife calls her lover and they have fun on the bed. The carpenter doesn't dare to move, he barely breathes. His wife suddenly spots him and arranges that her lover should ask in a loud voice whether or not she loves her husband. She protests in an equally loud voice that her love for her husband is the only reality in her life. Her present dallying with the lover means nothing more than a bored woman, woman's whimsy and it's so unimportant that she even doesn't feel guilty about it. The carpenter under the bed laps up her words and once the lover has left, he slides out from under the bed, clasps his wife in his arms, pets her, promises that she can jolly well enjoy herself as much as she wants because he knows that he is her real life and love. So the story leaves us with a puzzled feeling. It shows an abysmally stupid and besotted husband, a scheming, unfaithful, lying wife. The lover is very much a secondary character without any psychological depth. What has all this to do with a medieval mirror for princes? The moral, the moral lesson which closes the story in the Anvari Soheli is, I quote, and I have introduced this story to you so that like the carpenter who, has, who was cajoled by the words of his profligate wife, you might not be deceived by the words of this crow, nor seduced by his hypocrisy and artifices which smell of blood. Now, this is a typical example of what I um, mentioned as disingenuous lessons which top most of the Khalil and Dimna stories. They act as a smoke screen and either hone in on a secondary, irrelevant detail, or, as is the case here, they systematically give false indications. If we understand the story according to this moral lesson and decide that, as a husband, we must be aware of the wiles of women, otherwise we court ridicule, that's fine, but it doesn't take us very far, and it seems quite anecdotal for a book of royal advice. I would have thought a king would have learned that at his mother's knee, really. What is more relevant, I think, is to view this as a chess game or as a political game. Let's go back to the, moon, to the moment when the wife spots her husband under the bed. What does she understand? Her unfaithfulness is discovered by the husband, yes. But the husband does not jump up, shouting, threatening, publicly dragging the wife and the lover to a judge and demanding divorce. He's embarrassed. He remains under the bed. That is a signal that he is afraid of the scandal or that he needs his wife more than the salvaging of his honor. And the wife immediately acts upon this. She is going to offer her husband a comfortable platform on which they can both find the modus vivendi, despite the dishonor and the lover. And this is exactly what the husband needs. He embraces the manipulation wholeheartedly, preferring to pretend within the intimacy of his home that he's stupid, rather than having the dishonor made public. This is in fact a perfect solution. He keeps his affectionate wife, he keeps his honor, and he closes his eyes to her occasional whimsies. All is well. The wife has used very clever, manipulative, light touch diplomacy, and she has managed to deflect a most delicate situation. And we may and must easily translate this on a political level where diplomacy is so useful to deflect situations of conflict building up and leading to wars that no one really wants. In many situations, the parties prefer to keep a status quo if only they are not made to admit their unhappiness or to be, to be confronted by the obligation to recognize stains on their honor. On the level of narrative contents, the two next stories, which I, I'm going to tell now, caricature the husband's selfishness and lack of intelligent self-awareness. With these two additions, as Kashefi gives the decision-making role to the wives, he appears to be carrying the, the torch in protest against these unlikely matches. But the real re relevance of these two exceptional stories more than transcend the superficial social vaudeville as they introduce awareness of specific and unavoidable action patterns. 
frustration with this sorry lot triggers the wife's totally rational decisions. Stepping beyond the story setting and characterization, the pattern can be applied to any social or political relationship. They're designed to unravel the uh, rational reactions of opponents and ipso facto they suggest, if not preemptive measures, at least the possibility of preparing against their inevitability. This is what carries the episode's pedagogy. And remarkably, the wife's decisions announce the inexorable, almost mathematical logic of responses to situations which have since then been identified under the umbrella term of rational decision theory or game theory. So here comes the tale of the old farmer, his beautiful wife and the handsome prince. It opens on a promising farcical situation. An old, proud, impoverished farmer has a young and pretty wife. The husband's foolish pride prevents him from earning his living in the employment of those who once used to be his own employees. He prefers the risk of voluntary exile with his wife in search of other horizons where life might be easier. He shows his lack of psychological penetration when on the way he expresses his worries that she might find attractive men in their future abode. And the wife passionately pledges that her only wish is to remain faithful to him. And he believes her. En route, their path crosses that of an unbelievingly handsome prince on a horse who instantly falls in love with the pretty wife. She jumps on the horse, clasping his lissom wa waist, and away they gallop towards the horizon. The old farmer is devastated. In an intriguing coda, the moaning old husband tramps behind the pair of lovers and suddenly happens on his wife's dead body. A lion has attacked her while the dashing prince fled for his life. The old farmer weeps a little, powerfully affected by several thoughts, the way in which his wife has met her end, the cruelty of fate, her sin, his loss, her death. So this useless moral lesson encourages us to return to the story to work out its real significance. I rec recognize in it a double pattern of what is called the black swan phenomenon. The old and poor husband who ruins his and his wife's life by bad management of his affairs, his foolish pride and exile, contrasts so painfully with the dashing figure of the handsome prince on his horse appearing unexpectedly and magnificently overwhelming like a rare black swan, that the wife's decision becomes eminently rational. The option she chooses can have, as far as she is concerned, only two positive outcomes. She gains at least a moment of sexual bliss with a handsome young man and some sort of reward payment before being eventually chucked back into poverty. She might even go back to her old husband fold. And at best, she might find the love of a prince together with a life of comfort. She has no reason to submit to blatant nihilism and refrain from trying in the name of a wedding bond to a husband who does not fulfill his part of the contract. But the plot thickens as the black swan phenom phenomenon occurs a second time in the story when the overwhelming lion appears. The prince is presumably not equipped to fight this ferocious animal, though he should have been prepared as he was crossing wild territory. And his decision to run rather than risk his life for the bagatelle of, of, of this girl is equally rational. This time it's the eloping wife who has not made provision against the black swan occurrence. It shows how we in real life must remain on the alert even when it seems we have won the lo at the lottery. The ultimate guilt of the total catastrophe, however, lies at the door of the old husband who has not calculated the risks present, represented by his own sorry lack of dynamism, his poverty, his exile, and his old age when his dynamic and young wife would be confronted with more attractive options. He's equally wrong to ask his wife to promise she will stay faithful. This is meaningless, a meaningless promise made under duress. It's evident that at that particular moment, the wife has absolutely no other option than to remain by his side and therefore to cultivate his trust. Though he fears it in theory, as shown by his very request 
for a promise of faith, he has not foreseen the actual chance appearance of an irresistibly attractive contender to his wife's affection, nor her immediate decision to give him up for a prince. He seems unable to understand that she might prefer the promise of youth, love and riches to the other option of remaining tied to an old, proud, selfish fool. Now, a similar model of logic decision-making is present in the story of the grey-haired husband and his two wives. This is another story which Kashifi has added. It tells of a middle-aged grey-haired man who decided to take a second wife. She's naturally very young and very pretty and very ambitious. The older wife is terrified that she will totally lose her husband's affection and that he will end up divorcing her. At night, as he lays with her, she can't sleep and thinks. If I pluck out his black hair, leaving the white only, then as a young wife will look at him, she will see an aged man and run away from him. He will come back to me for affection and love. Thus away she plucks while he sleeps. The next night, as the husband sleeps with his young wife, his new wife, she also schemes away. The older wife is a threat, of course. In order to turn the husband away from this old witch, she must pluck out all his white hairs. As he will see himself in a mirror, a young man with only dark hair and beard, he will turn away from his former old wife and give all his affection and care to the new pretty one. And away she plucks while he sleeps. And as a result, the husband is bald. So this is in fact a perfect example of what is called the prisoner's dilemma. You have two revolutionaries which are caught, they're each put in a separate cell. The police tells the first that he has three choices. He speaks and he go as a free man. He stays silent but his friend speaks and he's executed while the friend goes a free man. Or he says, stays silent and the friend also stays silent and they both remain in jail for 30 years because he can never be sure that the friend will not speak. The only reasonable choice for the prisoner is to speak. He will be free and the chances are that his friend will also have spoken and that they both will be free. <coughs> now the same model applies to the wives. If the old wife does nothing, then she risks that the young one will act and that the husband will divorce her. If she does nothing and the young one doesn't do anything either, they both remain in limbo with the danger that one day one of them will act. If she acts and plucks the hair of the husband and the young one does not do anything, well, the husband will divorce the young one and she wins. If she acts and the young one acts as well, they both end with a bold husband. It's not very satisfactory, but it's relatively painless for both of them. And that's the only reasonable course for each of these two women. I always wonder what might happen if the husband married a third wife. Now, the Kalila and Dimna is a mirror for princes. This particular story will teach us, will teach the rulers, to think before we take a second wife and create a situation of unhappiness and security amongst our allies. The Kalila and Dimna text is a work which analyzes mistakes and the necessary counter moves of our allies and enemies. It does not really give us theoretical recipes to be successful princes, but it makes us think. And I have found that these stories, these vaudeville stories, particularly give us snapshots of inevitable counter moves which take all their significance when they are decoded. The fact that they are stated in this ridiculous form allows them, once decoded, to be applied to any situation and they are truly universal. So, um, it's... This, this mirror for princess targets a prince viewed as the person at court who has the ambition not only to stay alive in an ocean full of sharks but also to climb to the top and once up there this might come after the elimination of the current holder of the post to remain there. So the text talks to a ruler in place, to the would-be ruler, to any ambitious person on his way to the top. It does not look at the relation between the ruler and his people, as I said, which is the right place for discussions on morality, uh, but that aspect is quite out of the remit of the stories. And that is where Khalil and Demna is, is, is a different, misunderstood and jarring uh, mirror for princes. The stories function within the tri dangerous triangle in place between the ruler, his advisors and the courtiers. 
The relation between these two, these three groups is all at once indispensable, none can do without the two others, and it's also a minefield, as each one of the three is actively plotting, necessarily plotting against one of the others or against the two others uh, at the same time. To exercise morality in these circumstances is basically to sign your death warrant. The text takes apart a good number of situations and it proposes not recipes to win, but rather the analysis of the moves and the concatenation of results and the counter moves any strategic decision brings into motion. The reader is supposed to do the thinking and to apply the strategic vision he has acquired to his own situation with an awareness of the long view of the reactions his next move towards the top will call up with the opposition. I view the Khalil and Dimna as a literary image of a chess game. It's a difficult text. The insights it gives on court life are so very grim. And it fills me with so much admiration for those who manage to survive at the top in these minefields. But even the mirror for princess aspects can be decoded. The text is also universal. It's not limited to a particular ruler and his particular situation. The text has no relations to religious, cultural, chronological, geographical particularities. It transcends these details and it targets the core of political ambition. This last fact explains its bestseller status and its amazing translation and rewriting history. It also teaches us that politics, power, climbing, manipulating, convincing, alliances, treason are universal and obey to fundamental rules, whether we're looking at the Mongol prince, at present day David Cameron, at the politics within Cambridge University, or within a multinational company. So to conclude and return, return to our subaltern topic, I guess that my message today is, is very much that um, I hope I have managed to demonstrate how dangerous it is to use and to read literary texts without being aware of their purpose and also to read them through a certain lens without picking up the signals or clues that the authors are always careful to insert in their texts. Thus to me, the Khalil and Dimna stories with their stereotyped social types should be decoded with as, as much caution as those about animal characters interacting. They are all, in fact, images that, use, that are used to enact the models of psychology or uh, philosophy. And the, they enact these models in the most amusing, nonsensical social situation to alert us, to make us, to, to, to wake us to this uh, situation. And in our case, the story's misogynistic moral lessons are really red herrings. They're not serious. They're not showing the meaning of uh, these stories. That's where I stop. Right, questions from the floor. Derek. Hello, did you ever? Yeah. yeah. Thank you for that very eloquent uh, talk that obviously the style of, of Kashifi's writing has rubbed off on you because... <laughs> That's what many people say. <laughs> yeah, it, um, I'm not sure if this is a question, maybe more a comment, but um, I think this, uh, this sort of trope that's get, that he's uh, using, which is a fairly common one of, of you know, bringing up, I'm writing this under the cloak of metaphor and the disguise of illusion, blah, blah, blah is... Um, uh, I mean, it's, it's a very common one, and I think it, it also helps, it, it might further your argument to, um, to recognize that this is also a strategy, a uh, sort of practical strategy for people writing advice. Um, it sort of metapragmatically shows that if you're going to write advice to princes, you'd better use these kinds of stories, not just because it becomes you know, a bestseller that way, but because uh, you don't run the risk of losing your head by saying the wrong thing by, by mentioning someone. So it, it actually, he's demonstrating not only practical lessons for princes, but also for people writing advice to princes, the very people who are going to advise princes or write advice or in, in this kind of form. So I think you know, there's even, a metal level in which this is working for you. Okay, so that, that is something that we, uh, that we find very often, and I, I, I do not buy that. 
Absolutely oh. not. Um, I think, well, the first, the first remark is that uh, who are the patrons of these books? They're the princes. They're, they're asking for advice. They, they, want, they want to get the advice and they want to understand it. So uh, an author who would put that advice in stories which are too difficult for the prince to understand, um, you know, it, it, it really doesn't make sense. Um, what, what is happening is that um, this is not criticism on a prince, not at all. And, and, and yeah, the prince is, is in need of that advice, of that opening of the, of the chess game in front of him. He, he, he wants somebody to explain the things to him, he, 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 and he definitely wants to understand what is in the book. So these, these authors are not trying to use the stories as a smoke screen, not at all. And I don't know if that might be true with other stories, I doubt it very much. But I, I know that this is something that we find in, in, in lots of, I think, hasty explanations of, of these stories. No, no, um, the, the princes will dec decode the stories, will have people help them decode the stories, and will go to the, to the actual uh, reality of what they, they, they portray. Definitely. Um, otherwise, I mean, you know, it, it really doesn't make sense for them to uh, patronize these, these books if it's hidden criticism that they don't understand, but that somebody else who's more aware might understand. No, it, it, it really doesn't work uh, like that. Um, so the, the, the storytelling technique, um, and the authors tell you that in their, in their introduction, and I, Another thing that I really think is important is to take these introductions very seriously and really go to, to the, the, the depth of what these authors are, are, are mentioning in their introductions. These are not tropes, these are not a, 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 topus, a literary topus. They, they, they are informing you in their introductions of what they see as their writing technique and, and how to, to, to work with their book. So what the authors say is that the stories are there to be uh, attractive, to capture your attention, and to force you to think. And that, uh, as I mentioned, he wants an intelligent reader. He doesn't want, well, I mean, the, the stories will be nice for children, but that's not what he wants. The stories will be nice for the people who are just reading on surface, but that's not the, the, the crux of the stories. He wants an intelligent reader who can look beyond the screen of the stories. So uh, if you have, all the authors of the Khalil and Demna stories throughout all the versions who are telling you that, you're alerted that this is what is really necessary, what is needed. Now, uh, the storytelling technique in, in uh, philosophy, in um, um, political uh, works, is something that, that exists, that has been used ever since, and that has been rediscovered by philosophers like Hannah Arendt, for example. She will say that she, she wants to use storytelling um, because that's the only way to, to, to really um, express what is so complicated, so complex that no other you know, 300 pages books or 500 pages books will ever express. That the stories, because they are um, so, so dense, will force you as the reader to um, understand it in the way that's useful for yourself. And, and Kalila and Demna is such a book where, where really, um, I know, you make of it what, what, what you have in yourself and what you can project on these very stories. So I guess that if you read my book, you will know all about my inner, my inner thoughts and what, what, I, uh, what I think and, and how I, I work. I think it was Halal and then Susan will go, will go for a round, so thanks. Thanks, Derek, very much. Thank you very much. It seems there is a long list up for me. So, but uh, first of all, I must thank you for a successful uh, completion of your monologue. I mean, <laughs> what a wonderful use of the sabbatical. Yeah. So congrats. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was wondering. I mean, uh, I have a background in English literature. So somehow or other, I mean, very briefly, because I don't remember uh, quite a lot of it as yet. But say, uh, I read about say Eugen O'Neill's writing. Say, uh, when I remember, say, Desire Under the Elms, I mean, those are few of the modern dramas I'm, I'm, I'm talking about. So there are almost similar, you know, uh, incidents or rather, uh, uh, should I say, examples of immorality uh, in personal lives. But there aren't many moral lessons drawn upon. 
But now look at this you know, 15th or 16th century literature, and quite similar examples being used, but definitely specific moral lessons being brought. So any you know, advice for the you know, modern writers, I mean, if, if one of us are really contemplating of writing something, and how best we could draw upon from those, you know, I mean, like from Kashfis, I mean, as you say. So to integrate moral lessons within the you know, drama or rather, rather English literature in a very broad sense. <laughs> Just one or two sentences, maybe. Briefly. Thank you. Briefly, well, um, I, th I think whatever, um, whatever um, moral lessons Kashifi might uh, write in his uh, in his Anwar Suheli are disingenuous. They're not they're not related to the stories. They are um, very much an, um, yes a smokescreen. So and I, and I think in in. Um, in literature, there's nothing more attractive than seeing suddenly uh, that the author is going on a tangent on, on, onto something else. Uh, if you read, if you read a story which is, uh, well, obviously very naughty or, or anti-moral, and then you come to the, the, the lesson where the, the author says, "Well, you see that good is always winning," or something, and this is absolutely not what has happened in the story, then you, you, you go back and you try to understand what, what is happening with the story and, and, and you, you go deeper into it. So for me, Kashif's moral lessons are, are very much um, um, sort of flashing lights that we should go back to the stories and try to understand them in a different way. So I, I don't know that if I'm answering your, your question, but so uh, Anvari Soheli, Khalil and Dimna, Anvari Soheli is not about morality, not at all. It's not, well, it might be immoral, but it's amoral. It's nothing to do, and, and Kashifi says it in his introduction as well. He says this is not about moral uh, lessons, not at all. That's not what he's writing about. We'll, we'll move along very um, thank you very much. I wanted to add that it was really wonderful paper. I uh, wonder, uh, given the, uh, I think you very clearly make a case for the universality and the timelessness of Kashifi's texts and these Kalila Wedemne stories. I wonder if you can go back to the specificity of his time and place and the idea that this text is Kashifi's version or rethinking of the Kalila Wedemne stories. And that it does this tell us something about the the court of Sultan Hussein Baikara, the relationship among the, those famous, very powerful people that we hear about and know that he was connected to them? Does this reflect something of that particular time and place for which from which he in, gets inspiration, yeah. as you said, it's the end of his life when he is writing this, and to which he is responding? Yeah, um, very, very, um, very good um, uh, question. So, um, Kashifi, I think, I think uh, the obvious, um, the obvious thing, the obvious novelty that he introduces in his story, um, there is very much the style. Yeah, his style, which is, which is a, a, a difficult, a difficult baby there, but um, he shows. He shows a real involvement with the um, philosophical and psychological effects of literary tropes. So he knows, although he, he has a book on, on, on tropes, uh, which, is, which is more of a, of a summary. Uh, it's not a very, a very uh, um, in-depth study of, of uh, literature, but he shows in, in the way he's using metaphors, he shows that he himself, or the ambiance, for, uh, and certainly the audience who was going to taste his work, where th these were aware of how um, how literary tropes, how um, the, the the play with with words has a cognitive function. Um, how um, chiasm, for example, he uses th these in very specific circumstances where he's describing, um, yes, the, 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 the way he's writing. So there is a, an ex <coughs> and I haven't found that in, in other earlier works, so there is a, an exacerbated um, awareness of Belletri is a bit is a bit of an, a negative thing, but of of the of the psychology of the cognitive influence of um, tropes 
on the thoughts of the reader. And that is something that is probably uh, there in the ambiance of the Timurid court. So uh, a, first, a first element is this sophistication of language at the Timurid court. Another, uh, maybe, maybe it, it, it is a trope, uh, he says, well, the older version, the 12th century version of uh, the Persian version, which is my base uh, text, which I am re rewriting, uh, is a bilingual text. There's too much Arabic. My audience can't cope with that. Uh, so this beautiful book is left aside. I want to make it uh, known again. So I will purge it of all the Arabic version uh, verses in it, and I will just use what what is necessary of Quranic and Hadith uh, expressions. So uh, now. We must be very careful because to put too much significance on that because this is already what you find in the older uh, Persian version where he says I'm translating an Arabic text into Persian because my, my audience can't cope with Arabic anymore and so I'm putting it into Persian. But, so it, it's very much a trope, but it's there as well. And you can see that indeed he is purging uh, the text of lots of Arabic, uh, of, of half of it which is in Arabic. So. Um, there is also the awareness in the stories which he's adding to uh, his, his source text, the uh, desire to open up the, the, the text to his, uh, his readers. So there was a definite uh, desire from his audience to be able to tackle Khalil and Demna without somebody explaining it, which was probably what had to be done uh, before, because it's such a such a dense and, and complicated text. So the work of Kashifi as a rewriter goes also in the direction of um, exegesis, in put in the stories, put in the, the new stories that he's adding in the in the um, yeah in the prosimetrum. So he is definitely working towards a um, individual reading of the story, which might also be something. Well, very brief. Uh, I, will, I will try to be very brief. Thank you, Christian. Very, very nice paper. My question is very simple. Maybe you touch upon this in, in answering different questions. Do we have any ref I mean, you said, like, in the introduction, they also said that he wants an intelligent reader. How do we know he got it? I mean, do we have any evidence that the audience, the, the sultan, in, in the turn, said something, interpret the story in the way the author wanted, that you suggest the author wanted? Or could they just were amused by the fact that they just think that, you know, the prince is a coward because he ran uh, in front of the lion, or that the wife cheats the husband and the husband yeah. is stupid? Do we have any evidence to say that to what extent in the court it was perceived as the, in the way the author wanted? or it was just interpreted as an amusement story, and that's yeah. it. So I, I don't have them. Maybe people who are working on, uh, on the Timurid court will, will find references to that. But I, I would say that the, the, the simple fact that uh, Khalil and Demna, but especially Anwar Sohili became so famous that you have so many copies of it, uh, expensive copies, I, I really doubt that a prince is going to pay a lot of money for stories about an unfaithful wife and, and a funny, a funny amusement episode. They're, they're, the fact of the success of the text shows you that uh, it was valued and understood. Uh, now the author says I want an intelligent reader. He doesn't tell me what kind of intelligent reader he wants. He's just alerting us, opening the doors of uh, exegesis, uh, t telling us go beyond and, 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 and dig and find your own uh, chess moves. In, in, that, uh, in that story. Now, what you have with uh, the Arabic Kalila and Demna version, so not at the Timurid court anymore, well, you have philosophers who are mentioning Kalila and Demna. Philosophers who are uh, enacting with, with others in other situations Kalila and Demna stories. So this was not a, you know, a light, light text, definitely not. Um, but, yeah, at the Timurid court, I have no, no proof that Sultan Hussein Baikara read the story and acted in such a way. I don't know. But it, 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 it is such a fascinating text that once you start knowing how to decode it, it opens up in, in, in a marvelous way. And I encourage you all to run to your Khalil and Dimna stories tonight and, and, and try. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I just...